Yes, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Jakob Nidhoff Sørensen, and I'm the uh, CEO of uh, Air Greenland Group. All right. Well, thanks for talking to us this morning. Um, I'm going to read a couple of questions, not only from us, but from our readers about anything they have they're interested in about your airline there in Greenland. Um, first question is, once your newer runways open in Nuuk, Elulisat, and others, are you going to phase out your international hub there in Kangar Suswak? Yeah, so uh, today with uh, Kangar Suswak being the, the main hub, uh, of course, uh, the idea is uh, to switch the main hub to Nuuk um, and with Elulisat as a secondary hub. We'll still be flying into uh, Gaon uh with the domestic aircraft uh, and uh, hopefully there will also be demand for international charter flights to Gaon Sussok in the future uh, because I believe that Gaon Sussok will continue to be an attractive destination both for uh, tourism purposes but also with increased military activities. So, uh, so in terms of being the main hub, yes, we're going to uh, switch uh, to Nook, uh, but we'll still be flying into Gaon Sussok. Um, and I know you kind of briefly mentioned that you're going to uh, shift your hub. Does this also mean your new seasonal service from Kangasusok to Biland is going to switch to Nuuk? Yeah, most likely. Uh, well, yeah, that's that's going to be uh, the case. Uh, six, around 50-60% of the passengers, uh, the total passengers, are, are going to Nuuk. Uh, with Nuka as final destination, so it makes sense also to switch, switch the billion service uh, to Nuka in the future. All right. Um, will the service with your A330 NEO, is that going to be going to Nuke or Lulisa, or is it going to kind of alternate between the two? It's probably going to be primarily Nuke, and then in the high season, uh, we will alternate a little bit. Uh, the uh, the seasonal demand in in the set is uh, very variable, with very high demand in the uh, summer months and very low demand in the winter time. So um, in in the summer months, there will be will uh, make sense with the three thirty, but not in the winter time, where we'll probably be utilizing um, or dispatching an aerobody aircraft to in the set. Um, you recently announced that you're going to be resuming flying to Iqaluit in May of 2024. How do you plan on expanding with your newly announced partnership with Canadian North out of their hub there in Iqaluit? Yeah, so uh, we were very excited to uh, to uh, to stop uh, flying that route again. Um, there are uh, many, many ties between uh, our regions, our countries, uh, both cultural, uh, also business-wise. So I think it's going to make a big difference uh, that, that we we'll have the direct route. And of course, Canadian North is, uh, is a very important partner uh, in making the route um, viable and maybe even uh, making the route a year-round route. Uh, so of course, with their network, uh, they are key in, in, uh, in securing as many passengers as possible. Uh, so. Uh, and with their uh, with their routes, both Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, uh, and so on, um, I think that's going to make a difference. So they have a seasonal route um, to Toronto. Uh, hopefully, that will also uh, uh, at some point turn into a, an all year route. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, the Canadian North network is key to making our route to evaluate uh, a success. So now we're going to start up and. Uh, and hopefully, uh, we'll be a good. Uh, we'll be off to a good start uh, next year, and then I think when the market uh, sees the uh, opportunities, I think we're gonna. Uh, I'm sure that we're gonna see uh, the uh, taking off in, in a positive way, um, both in terms of tourism, but also within the uh, mineral exploration sector. Uh, a lot of Canadians are working in Greenland uh, in the mineral exploration uh, field. Uh, and also with the new airport being built in South Greenland by a Canadian company, uh, there's definitely a basis for for passengers from from southern Canada as well as uh, uh, Munam. All right, awesome. Um, I know briefly you served the United States in the early 2000s through Baltimore. 
Um, with these new runways opening up and the hopefully increased tourism, do you plan on ever resuming a route to the United States, whether that be Baltimore or somewhere else? Uh, it's probably not going to be Baltimore, but we're definitely looking at the United States. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a great interest in Greenland in the United States, and it's actually a very short flight from Greenland to, say, New York. It's, uh, it's actually a shorter flight than the Copenhagen flight. Uh, so, yes, we are definitely looking at expanding our route network towards the West. The main sort of constraint at the moment is that all the, uh, the hotel capacity, the receiving capacity in Greenland is close to maximum at the moment. So uh, we could open a route, but then we would just cannibalize passengers from, from other uh, regions because uh, the, the, the whole system is running at close to max capacity at the moment. So when the new airports open, uh, that will uh, definitely uh, make the investing uh, easier and more attractive. So we are seeing a lot of uh, projects at the moment uh, maturing. So I think within a few years time, we'll definitely see uh, see expansion towards the West. Awesome. Yeah, well, I'm definitely looking forward to them coming to the United States. Um, in the 2022 annual report, Air Greenland mentioned they signed a letter of intent to increase strategic cooperation through code share with Iceland Air. What does this mean exactly, and how do you continue to act upon this going forward into the future? Yeah, Iceland Air uh, have a, uh, they are, are geographically well located uh, in the North Atlantic, and they have a very strong international network. Um, and especially uh, the North American network is very interesting for Air Greenland, and as I mentioned earlier, um, if we're going to uh, increase uh, towards the West, towards the U.S., uh, the, the code share agreement with Iceland there is, is a very important step uh, in building the traffic uh, and can benefit uh, both airlines, especially uh, at the current time where, as I mentioned, the capacity is constrained. So, um, so, so I think through Iceland Air, we are really be able to, to expand and uh, build the Greenlandic uh, tourism industry in, in sort of organic increments. Um, and uh, so I'm utilizing their very strong international network to the benefit of uh, both companies. One of the, uh, one of the um, prerequisites for uh, such an, uh, a partnership is IOSA certification. And uh, we estimate to be IOSA certified by the uh, by, by spring of next year, and, and then we can uh, start acting upon the, uh, the intentions that we have signed together. Okay, awesome. Um, all right, uh, it's been just slightly over a year. Actually, I think a year was this past week with your new flagship A330 Neo. How has the first year been with the aircraft? Have you kind of seen any challenges that have been unexpected or expected? The first year has been great. It has the aircraft has outperformed uh, the expectations, uh, both in terms of reliability and in terms of uh, fuel consumption. And it's also been very, very well received by the passengers. So in every way, it has been a great success. Um, it was at the time, well, it is, still is the biggest investment in the company history. So uh, of course, as CEO, you are a little bit anxious when you when you get the keys and you uh, start operating the aircraft. But uh, a year down the road, uh, it's all smiles. Uh, we are so happy uh, with the aircraft, and it has been uh, the right decision for for our airline. Um, the only we have, we had a problem with uh, two GPS antennas, uh, and we had those uh, switched, and that's the only problems that we've had uh, with with the aircraft. Uh, apart from uh, a handling a ground handling incident in Copenhagen, where the uh, handling agent uh, towed the aircraft into an A320, uh, mm -hmm. and both aircraft lost, but you can't really blame that on the aircraft. Uh, so. Um, Apart from that, we haven't had any, any issues at all. Great. 
Awesome. Yeah, I think coincidentally, I was on that aircraft the night that happened. I flew into Copenhagen on the 23rd, and then I saw it was grounded for the next couple of weeks, and I was so happy that I was able to fly on it just before then. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that was horrible. Yeah. <laughs> That's um, just the uh, the message you don't want to get. <laughs> right, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm glad I got to fly that plane, though. Um, yeah, yeah. What is the first thing that you want passengers to know when they step on board your new flagship versus the older A330-200? Well, first of all, we, we want people to feel that they are already in Greenland when they enter the aircraft. And that, that was true to the old aircraft and to the new aircraft. But of course, with the new aircraft, we want people to, we want our customers, our passengers to feel that uh, they have entered into a modern aircraft and, and feel that this is a, a professional airline that operates modern, well-maintained, and nice-looking uh, equipment uh, that, that, that is uh, comfortable for the passengers. And, and I think you get that feel when you get into the aircraft that, uh, that, that it's, uh, it's well-maintained, it's, it's nice-looking, uh, it's, it's well-thought-out. That, that's basically what we, we want people to feel. With the IFE, the in-flight entertainment system, which is all designed in-house by our own uh, marketing people, uh, it's the same thing. We want to give people a different experience than just a standard IFE. Uh, we want people to get the feel for everything that Greenland has to offer in terms of culture, people, nature, experiences, and, and so on. Your, I know your trunk route of your airline is your Greenland to Copenhagen route. Do you tend to see more passengers or more cargo on that route? Well, it's uh, we definitely see a a year on year growth uh, in passengers. Um, I think on the cargo side, the demand is there, but. With the current infrastructure, we have bottlenecks that limit the amount of cargo that we can bring in. And especially in times of bad weather and irregularities, the cargo um, is held up for for quite a long time, and it, it takes a long time to, to clear uh, to clear the backlogs. And that, that sort of puts a limit to the cargo flows. But I think with the new airport opening in Europe, we will also see uh, uh, significant uh, growth in, in cargo numbers. So over the last few years, it's been definitely has peak growing growth, uh, not cargo, but I expect the cargo to pick up as soon as we uh, we have the bottom next removed with the new infrastructure. All right. Um, I know you also fly a you know a couple times a week Iceland flight in the summer months. Or, yeah. I'm sorry, in the winter months. Um, do you, yeah. Does that route see more cargo or passengers, given it's on a Dash 8? Uh, that's definitely passengers, because it's it's a very long flight in a Dash 8, so you're uh, limited on your payload, uh, which basically means that it's it's there are times with headwinds where you can't even do a full load of passengers. And that also limits the uh, the amount of cargo that we can bring on that route. So, so that's definitely a passenger, on a uh, passenger focused uh, route, uh, and not so much cargo. Okay. Um, so you operate a single long haul aircraft, the A three thirty Neo. You know, eight dash eights, helicopters, medevac. How does the airline handle the complexity of this? You know, multi aircraft system. And each plane is so very different from the next. Yeah, that's 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 a difficult task, and and the only way that we can handle it is by employing really 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 skilled people, uh, uh, people with uh, many years of experience and and professionals who who know their stuff. So we have probably within the European system. Uh, the most complicated uh, air operator certificate uh, of all, uh, and that, that of course um, is is a difficult task. So, but uh, I'll definitely hand that to uh, to our very very skilled people and and very um, uh, well, 
we have very engaged and loyal staff, uh, and, uh, be it within flight operations or technical or ground operations. Uh, and that's that's how we make it work. Uh, we're not a lot of we're not a lot of people here, uh, but we are very we have very dedicated people uh, who've been doing this for a long, long time. So that's that's it's people who make it work. Um, as the dash eights, you have eight of those. As they increase in cycles and the hours that they've flown, what are the plans to replace those, if any, with you know newer, slightly old, less old dash eights, or do you plan on finding a different aircraft type to replace the dash eights with? Uh, the, the dash eight uh, two hundred that we operate, uh, and they're all modified. Uh, by the way, uh, to, to fit our current operating environment. Uh, it's a great aircraft, but it's also uh, getting old, uh, as you mentioned. And today there isn't really a, a potential replacement aircraft. We are uh, anxious to see the new uh, ATR-42-600 stall version. Um, what the capabilities of that aircraft uh, are. Um, so basically we have uh, only uh, very few options, and one of them is, of course, uh, uh, extending the, the runways that we operate into. And, and that discussion is slowly uh, starting to, uh, to unfold with, with the government. Um, but uh, we don't really have very many options. Fortunately, the Dash 8 aircraft is limited by cycles, and we operate long legs, which means that we don't put very many cycles on the aircraft. So we still have quite a few years to go before they uh, before they reach uh, the, the limits. But of course, the older the, the older an aircraft gets, the more difficult it gets to get spare parts, the more expensive spare parts get. Uh, so we are, uh, of course, it's something that we're looking at closely and, and following. and. Uh, in a, in a few years, we need to have a plan for replacing those aircraft. Replacing them with new Dash 8s is not really an option, because they are fairly new. The, uh, I think the last 200 was built in 2009, so uh, that's not really an option. Um, I know you said they the Dash 8s are modified. How and what do you do to modify these aircraft there in Greenland? So all, all the uh, Dash 8 200, the 200 was born without ground spoilers. So uh, so we modified it, all the 200s with ground spoilers. That's basically to reduce the takeoff uh, distance required um, and uh, thereby increasing the uh, potential payload during takeoffs. Uh, we also have aircraft with long range tanks that uh, extends the range of the aircraft. Uh, we have uh, put glass cockpits in, uh, in, in some of the aircraft as well. Um, and we have also modified, uh, basically purchased uh, and developed a performance data that, uh, that fits our current uh, operation in Greenland. All right. Yeah, I know I was on the Iceland flight I took, I was on, I believe it was Golf Romeo Papa was one of the auxiliary fuel tank ones, and I had the pilots were telling me about yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So you increase the fuel capacity from about 2,500 kilos to uh, to 4,500 kilos, which is almost it's like an 80 percent increase of fuel capacity. Awesome. Which which helps. <laughs> oh yeah, especially on those three-hour Dash Eight flights from Iceland. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so. We're kind of at the end of COVID, but how did that affect your operations there in not only Greenland, but on your international flights to Iceland and Copenhagen? So COVID uh, hit us really hard. So in the beginning, everything was of course shut down. We didn't have COVID in Greenland. Uh, the government managed to keep COVID out of Greenland for a long, long time. So um, but they were very strict on who they let into the country. Uh, so our international flights reduced to one a week in the beginning, um, with only uh, passengers allow allowed by the government. Um, but because of the cargo demand, we had to increase the flights to three a week. Uh, 
that's a bunch more they were full of cargo but we only had like 34 passengers and each flight was it's not a lot in a 330 uh on the domestic network uh we also had to keep you know cargo going around and uh, medicine and covid samples and so on so we we entered an agreement with the government uh, we purchased basically flight hours at cost the cost of producing the hours and thereby we could keep the uh, the airline going um uh didn't have very many passengers uh and we had to uh, to let go of uh, about 20 25 percent of the, uh, the workforce so mm-hmm. it's pretty it was pretty tough but we uh, quickly quickly came back we had a uh, 21 in the summer season it was really really good um and once you know everyone got omicron in the beginning of 22 and after that you know everyone just started flying again and we were back to uh well, we are way above pre-COVID levels now, so uh, so we are trying to forget COVID and uh, just look forward. Oh, absolutely. I know everybody is kind of trying to forget that, and I'm glad to hear that, you know, there's the passenger numbers are going up. The The Copenhagen flight I was on, I believe, was completely full when I took that. But, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, other than your flight to Iceland, I've noticed that there seems to be dramatically fewer flights on Sundays in your system than any other day of the week. Why is this? Yeah, that's a really, really good question because Sunday is typically the the, the most busy day of the week for for an airline. Um, but that's basically because of the system here with the airports um, and they are manned. Uh, uh, for six days a week. So if we want to fly on Sundays, we have to pay quite substantial fees, opening fees for the airports. So it's not really economically viable to operate a uh, full Sundays. We do in the summertime, uh, because we need to, but, uh, but not in the, in the winter time. And that's of course, because the airports, um, they, they are staffed. Uh, if they, if they, if they want to do a seven day a week, uh, Opening hours, they have to employ, of course, more staff, and and that's only one, uh, one customer, and that's their agreement. Uh, so that that's just too expensive. All right. That that's the reason. All right. Um, with your newer runway opening there in Nuke, how do you expect the the newer approach systems? I saw that they were just put up a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month at this point. How do you expect that newer landing system to affect, or I guess in this case, improve your operating there in new? I think it's going to be a game changer. It's going to make a huge difference. Um, so we're going to get ILS instrument landing system category one, which is of course not uh, the, the best you can have, but, but it's a great improvement compared to what we have today. Um, I'm, uh, I, I used to fly the S8 myself as a pilot, and, and for the, uh, the alerts out there, today we operate what, what is called an offset localizer approach, uh, which basically means that you're coming off in at an angle to the airport, you're not coming straight in. And, and you, have to, you have to be able to see the airport today from 1.8 knots per mile away, and you can go down to uh, about uh, 600 feet. It's, it's it's a long way from the airport. In the in the uh, with the new ILS system, uh, you go down to 200 feet, and you'll have glide slope guidance, and you'll have uh, nice approach slides, and a wider runway, and everything. So I think that's going to greatly improve the operational uh, reliability uh, or the regularity uh, in and out of. Uh, so looking, looking forward to that, definitely. Um, with the newer runways opening there, do you see, I know you said your tourism constraint there because of the number of hotel rooms and places to stay, um, that, and that is why you're not expanding service. Do you see that there might be any other competition when those newer runways open from other airlines? And if so, you know, how is... Air Greenland prepared to handle this new competition that they've never really kind of had in the past? Yeah, that's a good question. Of course, if you're looking at Nuke and Eagle Sets, there's definitely going to be interest from other airlines, uh, especially in the summertime. 
uh, because that's when the passengers num passenger numbers are, are higher. Um, and uh, you can see if you look at the unit cost, Greenland is, is uh, competitive. Uh, but the way the system works today, um, where you have a combination of you know the domestic network and the international network today, all international passengers they fly on a domestic flight, uh, either going to or from. Um, so uh, so that way, both the international flights uh, and the domestic flights are paying for the the whole system, so to speak. So if we get into a very competitive situation, that's going to affect the domestic network because. Um, uh, we, of course, have to match the, the prices of our competitors, but that means that we will have to increase the prices on the domestic network. Uh, and, and that's going to be, of course, uh, a problem or a challenge. Uh, as I said in, uh, in the beginning of, of my answer, the unit cost for operating the international routes, they're competitive, uh, but our prices are probably a little bit higher than, than other operators, but that's because we are using that excess money to, to fund sort of the domestic network. Whereas in the US, you have the essential air service. Uh, in Europe, you have the PSO system uh, where the government funds uh, some of the thinner uh, routes. Uh, we don't really have that system on the domestic network in Greenland. So that's going to be interesting to see how that that, that plays out. If we're going to see too much cherry picking from other airlines, it's going to be a big problem for, for the whole sort of the whole system. But of course, we're uh, preparing by having uh, a competitive schedule, uh, having a competitive product, uh, and hopefully the passengers will choose their agreement uh, with some of the other uh, competitors that are potentially uh, starting new services. All right. Um, your A330neo flies on 5% sustainable aviation fuel, which is really great. Um, is there anything else you plan on doing to increase your sustainability, not only on your A330, but your other domestic flights around the country? Yeah, and uh, that's that's also a good question because uh, one of the reasons for investing in the 5% uh, sustainable aviation fuel was to, to boost investments in a sustainable aviation fuel. We were uh, that we were made it possible to to get SAF out of Copenhagen Airport, uh, and, and that's really really great. Uh, the big issue for airlines today is that you know the, the production of SAF is not ramped up, it's not scaled up uh, to a level where uh, every, anyone can get it. And so if if you if you take too much, then you just drive up the price. Uh, so it's a balance right now of, of supply and demand. Um, and of course, uh, we want to fly with as much sustainable aviation fuel as possible. Uh, but it's also a matter of, of driving inventions. If you look at the uh, the helicopters, we've switched um, the whole helicopter fleet, uh, and especially the change from the old Bell 212 helicopters to the new uh, Airbus 155 helicopters reduces CO2 emissions by around 40 percent, which is you know a great reduction. On the Dash 8 domestic fleet, we uh, we uh, have a lot of initiatives on, on direct routings, optimum descents, uh, apps that uh, that optimize the you know, settings on on each flight and so on. So so yes, we're doing a lot of things. Uh, we're changing all our ground equipment to electrifying uh, electrified equipment uh, and so on. So so yes, we're we're doing all all that we can. Um, and, and of course, we don't think it's it's going fast enough. But uh, we are trying to uh, to drive uh, the uh, the initiatives as far as we can. Awesome. Um, I know everybody, the airline that they work for, you know, is great. But what is if there was one thing you could do to improve Air Greenland right now? What would that be? Definitely uh, better better weather. Oh, I yeah. would improve the weather. <laughs> the weather is our biggest challenge, uh, and um, so of course I can't change the weather. But uh, if if we were to improve mm -hmm. our operations, then we would uh, definitely uh, if if we could deal with weather conditions uh, in a more optimum way, that would that would increase. 
uh, the experience for our customers. So uh, we are lacking approach aids at many of the airports. Uh, we could get uh, better landing systems, not just in Munkanin, but also on the coastal airports that would greatly improve the others. Um, well, thank you so much for talking to me. It's been great, you know, speaking with you and asking, you know, a list of questions with the airline, not only from me, but from our readers. Uh, I know I definitely learned a lot and had fun learning about your airline, and I'm sure other people will as well. Excellent, and the pleasure is all mine, and uh, I hope to see you back in Greenland uh, sometime soon. Absolutely. I would love to visit Greenland again.